good morning, everyone. Welcome back to uh, our course on Troublemaker for Justice, the story of Wyatt Rustin. Uh, it was a fabulous discussion on last week, and so we're, we're looking forward to hearing your voices uh, this week as well. Uh, so welcome. I am uh, new at uh, this technology, as many of you are, so I hope you will be patient with me. Um, I am Lily Edwards. I think uh, we have one guest on uh, today who will introduce uh, Bianca. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Back again for week two. Very excited to yes. be here. Um, I don't know if any of you, does anyone need a Zoom refresher? Are you feeling probably a lot more competent than I feel? <laughs> Do you want us on mute? Or? Yes, please. That would that would be great. Um, I I do know I have the capacity to mute everyone here somewhere. Yes. <laughs> Everybody okay. mute themselves, Lily. You're good. Okay, great. Um, so Bianca is going to, uh, well, before we begin, let's do one introduction. Uh, Jacqueline Houtman uh, has, is joining us. As you know, uh, Jacqueline is uh, one of the three co-authors of Troublemaker for Justice. So thank you for the book and thank you for joining us today. That is very, very exciting. Well, I'm yes. just gonna lurk and listen because it sounds like you have a lot of great stuff to say. <laughs> Um, we thought we would begin by just a little bit of an overview of what we did last week so we have some continuity from, mm -hmm. um, from our discussion. Bianca, you want to jump in here? Sure. So first we talked about our, we talked about our identities last week and how everyone has different identities that are important to them. And we talked about the idea of concentric circles. So meaning uh, there, are, there are certain pieces of your identity that you think about the most, ones that you think about occasionally, and ones that you think about probably every single day or very, very often. And how with these identities, you can experience marginalization um, whether that's individual, whether that's from a group, whether it's from a community, and what that could potentially look like for you. So that could be feeling isolated from the long-term care facility that you're in because uh, no one shares your religion, or it could look like uh, not being chosen to speak up uh, for your community because they don't wanna hear from your community, right? It looks different for everyone. And we talked about also the combination of everyone's identity, giving each and every one of us a really unique way of looking at the world and making decisions and even our changing our thinking patterns as well through the lens of intersectionality, right? Because as we said last week, it's very hard to be able to prioritize which identity is more important to you and only view the world through that one lens that you have right? It's, it's not something that anyone can really do, really. And so when we think about our identities and they, how much they really play, we have to think about Rustin and the identities that he had throughout his life. Because um, one of the great things that the book does is it breaks apart, you know, him as a Black man, him as a Quaker, <clears throat> him and his sexual orientation, which we also went into uh, talking about the differences between sex assigned at birth, which is something that's biological, it's characteristics that we can't help, so hormones, chromosomes, etc. Your gender identity, which is how you feel about yourself. So if you identify as a man or a woman, that is your gender identity. And then based on your gender, you have roles or expressions that you uh, participate in dependent on whatever culture and society that you are in. And then we have your sexual orientation, which is of course who you are attracted to, right? And then we looked at LGBTQ history, which for the most part, some of you might remember, right? Uh, 
not being able to go to bars in public if you're an LGBTQ person, not being able to show public displays of affection, being able to be fired, right, from, be, from being an LGBTQ person. And we even examine that some of those laws are still in practice today. You can still be fired, right? There are lots of states, there's 29 states where you can still be fired for being LGBTQ. Um, we looked at uh, the Lavender Scare and how, you know, you have the government uh, pretty, pretty much trying to say that being LGBTQ is a security risk to the country and associating it with communism. Um, and what kind, of, what kind of experiences that he had as a gay man, right? Opportunities that he had that were taken away from him because of his identity, because he was arrested in California, um, because of his a sexual encounter with another man, right? And we looked at, uh, we had, there was a few, a quote that I had in there that talked about, you know, him being comfortable with who he is and not wanting to hide who he is, but also recognizing that being a gay man might limit what he wants to do and how basically for the larger civil rights movement that he had to kind of push away his sexual orientation or it wasn't in the light because it would it would have stunted the civil rights movement right i think we talked a little bit about um uh them wanting to publish in papers that he's a pervert that he had some romantic connection to Dr. Martin Luther King, all these things that would have pretty much ruined, you know, the March on Washington. That's what we talked about last week. But I think for this week, we're going to go more into race because we didn't have enough time to talk about that. Because um, we got, we pretty much spoke mostly about sexual orientation last week. But this week, we're going to go more into race and what that holds and also the Black church, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we, we, in some ways, have contradicted ourselves by having these two sections, right? One on LGBTQ and one on race. But we needed to unpack how each of those is constructed differently, although we may see uh, clear similarities in how power, privilege, uh, marginalizing occurs politically, economically, socially, culturally in both of those arenas of people being both pushed to the periphery, but I would say that in both cases, we're talking about a process of dehumanizing, right? And all that dehumanizing uh, means. So as even as we focus on race today and un unpacked uh, how it is constructed, how it evolves, how it manifests itself, how uh, notions of race become policies of racism, I want us to integrate that into the LGBTQ constructions as well, all right? So we, we can now kind of pull that into the discussion on race so that we uh, recognize and validate the intersectionality. Uh, we're going to take a deeper dive into looking at uh, uh, Bayard's family and community institutions, obviously his household, which is really important, uh, his religious beliefs and values, and his experiences at two HBCUs. Um, and then we'll look at the broader societal constructs, kind of put him within his time of Jim Crow segregation, and obviously putting him within what historian, some historians now refer to as the long civil rights movement. Not a 50s, 60s movement, but a 30s to 50s movement. A movement very often we look at in terms of what's called that classic period. We think about 50s, 60s, but the work really starts in the 30s and we see Bayard there doing some of that, that early work. Um, and then just to let you know where we're going, uh, for next week in our last class, we want you to uh, be prepared at the last 10 minutes to just throw out some topics and questions that you want us to um, uh, uh, continue discussing or, new, or things we didn't bring up that you're curious about and you want to discuss. We want to make sure in that last class we include that. And uh, next week, we will also have a power and privilege activity so we can kind of uh, uh, role play 
of what power and privilege uh, looks like, and Bianca will lead us in that. So we're all set on where we're going today and where we're going next week. Let's start with race. Um, as a social construction, uh, what this quote uh, from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy tells us is, uh, uh, is that scholars have this consensus that discrete and essentialist uh, definitions of race are not biologically real, that it is something that is socially constructed. Let me pose a question to, to all of you now. Um, if race is not bi biologically real, does it exist? Does race exist? Because you will hear people say, right, there is no such thing as race. Is that true? It might be true by definition and how it's been constructed. But if you look at society, race definitely exists because in every aspect of life, uh, the majority and those who have been in power have used this construct of race to determine who gets what, who doesn't, and who is identified as a person. So um, in reality, it does exist. And there's a lot of negative implications and you can't really deny that, I think. Right, that's great. So you said a couple of things that I think are really important. You mentioned the word power, which is how does this construction manifest itself in real life? What kind of decisions do people make? What kind of laws do they make? How do they behave in ways that uh, define race, not in terms of bio biology, but it definitely does it in terms of power. Who has power over whom? Um, uh, and the uh, 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 second thing I think you mentioned was um, uh, also behavioral, kind of what do people actually do? And what are their actions? Anyone else, Barbara? I think you unmuted. Yeah, um, if you look at any government form, you look at anything we fill out for to go to school, registration for, uh, for uh, school, for voting, any for any form, there's always the question, what is your race? And you right. have to fill that out. So I think it's a legal, it's, it's a definite legal entity. So it can have a legal, which is really important, that it has a legal reality. And, yes. and we'll see in our discussion where that legal reality comes from, because who decides what those categories are? Bianca talked to us last week about um, self-identity, kind of how you identify yourself, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is in part what those forms are asking you to do. Who do you say you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> But the question becomes, when we think about the social construction, how, how am I or how do you as an individual come to that conclusion? <laughs> you know, what are the, almost what are the um, criteria for that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that takes us to something, I believe Jennifer talked about. Jennifer for, is from South Africa. Yes, I am. Uh, okay. I remember. So uh, you will be familiar with this. Um, uh, this is a quote from the uh, New York Times written by Enzikio Mfilele, who is a uh, um, uh, novelist and professor at the University of Pennsylvania talking about um, the category in South Africa of being an honorary white um, during the period of apartheid and what yeah. that right? Yes, honorary whites were people of maybe Chinese or even Indian or black Americans who came to South mm -hmm. Africa were honorary whites. 
as long as you don't have a South African identification like black right. or colored, right. you will always be non-white. But if right. you were a guest from the US or a local Chinese, uh, Amer uh, Chinese South African person, mm -hmm. you were considered honorary white. Right, right. So, so mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, talking about race is, I think, the question that people have about what race you are is kind of leading into the fact that they want to judge you. That's what I feel. Mm -hmm. The first question is, if you're Black, oh, okay, so they start judging you. So I just feel like that is the problem with race identification, that it's all just meant to be a judgment on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it becomes a social, cultural, political, and economic category mm -hmm. uh, based upon phenotype, based upon supposedly being able to look at you and determine uh, what, uh, that, how you look has meaning. Um, this, what, what I think this does, uh, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, Jennifer, the idea of honorary white shows just how arbitrary the categories are. Oh yes. Right? Right? Oh, that they that they have no reality that someone who clearly is black in Guyana. Black American. Or, right. Or is a professor at University of Pennsylvania who yes. has him checked off as being a black faculty member, goes to South Africa, right? as this delegate of the United Nations, as a guest mm -hmm. of the South African government, as a yeah. award winner for his um, uh, fiction, and becomes white while he is I remember visiting Andrew Young. An, an apartheid nation. Right, same thing with Andrew Young, same thing with athletes, yes. uh, same thing with people um, who, have been, who may have been working for corporations or um, or another foreign government, uh, it shows, in fact, the way race has an intentional construction. It is not arbitrary. Yes. Right? And with um, the South African government, it was def definitely arbitrary. They just went around deciding, making up rules as they went along, and whatever they decided, that was it. It was law. So, right. And what yeah. And one of the things we sometimes think about with the United States, when we think about segregation and we think early 20th century or post-Civil War, we don't think about where did Jim Crow come from, that it actually has a much longer history. And we'll see how it actually has a northern history as opposed to a southern history, which of course makes it right. yeah. national. Um, I was just reading in the Wall Street Journal magazine a review of a new book by Britt Bennett uh, entitled uh, The Vanishing Half. And um, in that article, Britt, uh, uh, there's a quote by her that talks about passing. So the book is about passing, about Black people who have the physical features of being uh, uh, that look European very straight hair, very light skin, very keen facial features. Um, sometimes it include very light eyes, it, that combination, such that they may look white and can pass for white. Um, and what uh, she writes about is race being performed, race as performance. Um, if race, uh, if we look at race as performed, does that also um, tell us something about defining race? Let me ask the question differently. How do we see Wyatt Rustin in terms of performing race? What would that look like? What do you think that looks like in his own life? I think he was definitely defined as Black. He fought for the Black cause and uh, anyone who read or heard of him would know that he was Black. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, one of the things that um, we could also ask is, uh, um, is there a way in which sexuality and gender are also performed? Do we see that in Fired? Yes. Could you talk about that? How, how do we see performance of gender, uh, sexual orientation? How is that performed? Well, he identified himself as a gay man. Yes, and he was very proud of telling people, you know, that he was a gay man. Um, in a very difficult time, in a very difficult era. So, I mean, he stood up when most other people didn't stand up. I mean, he was amazing. One of the things we talked about last week is uh, the degree to which he was always true to himself. We Absolutely. can even say he um, was self-aware, kind of self-aware of who he was and um, both as a male, as gay, as black, uh, and we should add as Christian, as Quaker, right? Yes. All of those, yes. all of yes. those um, pieces. And what we don't see in his life that most of us do at some point or the other, uh, and that is engage in a performance where we mask something that we think goes against um, kind of societal <laughs> norms. Um, you know, in the racial sense, it would be passing because you're, you can, you look white enough that you actually can fold into white society and, and deny parts of your blackness. Mm -hmm. um, for the LGBTQ community, it's being in the closet. Right. Right. It's uh, right. don't ask, don't tell. You know, it actually can mm. be, uh, as we said earlier, it can be legal um, and codified mm -hmm. that you should stay in the closet and then you can go and pick up your gun and die for America. Right. Right. Uh, on a battlefield someplace. And uh, I think Bianca? that even, even if, like, if we examine him and we look at his identity of his sexual orientation, I believe, I truly believe in my heart of hearts, if he were a more feminine man, a man that wore uh, women's clothing, a man that was not, uh, not masculine, I definitely think in a way, a lot of people didn't know consciously that he was gay even mm -hmm. though he didn't go out of his way to hide it because he he could pass by playing the part right mm -hmm. so i'll give you i'll give you a perfect example um i'll use myself i am engaged to a woman if i walk outside i usually have if we were not in quarantine i would have my makeup done i have my nails done purse i'd be wearing a dress and heels so to the average person i'm just another woman walking mm -hmm. down the street that's probably with a man you wouldn't be able to look at me and be like that person's a part of the lgbtq community now the person that i'm engaged to she you might look at her because she is more masculine in her appearance and say oh that person looks like they're a part of the lgbtq community right when we look at pictures of him in the past he has on a nice suit shoes are polished hair is done, right? He doesn't necessarily have a feminine appearance, which is often associated with gay men in the LGBTQ community. So he does have a little bit of privilege because he can pass through society without people questioning him and assuming that he is gay. They were more likely to just assume that, you know, he, he was just going through this world on his own. He would, if you asked him about his sexual orientation explicitly, he would tell you. But if you just saw him passing down the street, you would not say, that's an LGBTQ person over there. Let me go arrest them or beat them up, right? And that's probably why he was able to advocate and uh, get in certain spaces because mm. 
his gayness was quote unquote not in your face or being shoved down your throat. And so what we what we see interestingly, right, Bianca, is his male identity, especially as an athlete, right? I mean, yes. he is he is pedestaled as not just an athlete, but he's really good at it. Yeah. And he, you know, he's kind of so the the way we have uh, uh, constructed gender that at that physical athleticism, the kind of uh, uh, visual use of the mm -hmm. testosterone somehow creates a, a, a heterosexual identity, right? Absolutely. Um, because it's manly men. <laughs> yes, he's a, he's a manly man, right? <laughs> he's playing all different kinds of sports, you know, and that's not usually associated with being a gay man unfortunately, that, that yeah. sissy kind of stereotype, right. Right. Uh, you know, that demasculization of gay men mm -hmm. is part of what people expect for the LGBTQ community if you're a cisgender uh, gay man, but that's right. not something that right. he did. Right. Isn't it also true, though, that in his day, most gay men were, uh, you know, closeted, and didn't yes. exhibit, you know, like nowadays, yes, That's, there's a much more freedom to, you know, absolutely. express your your uh, sexual identity or your gender mm -hmm. identity so that you, you, it's more easy to identify gay men or women because they're able, you know, able in our society to do it now. In his day, I don't know that it would have been, I don't know who was clearly out and, uh, you know, recognized as, as, as gay. I just don't know, but it's easier now because it's, it's sort of accepted in a way to show that identity. It definitely is a lot easier, but there are a few uh, figures in the past that um, were a part of the LGBTQ community and expressed it in their gender expression. However, a lot of them were associated with show business yeah. See, because in the past, show business was an excellent way for you to act outside of your own gender expression, right? If we're talking about like Shakespearean times, it wasn't uncommon for men to play the role of women and society accepted that. So like in the past, you know, during his lifetime, there probably were people that were LGBTQ, of course, and they might have expressed themselves differently, but um, they might have expressed themselves differently. Their uh, profession, right? Because if, if I also think that if if Rustin wasn't involved in the political piece, maybe he would have been able to express himself however he wanted to, right? If he wasn't necessarily under the the lens of like advocacy and civil rights and, and only mostly being about race, mm -hmm. and maybe that's something that's, you know, maybe that was something that was in his mind, who knows, right? I wish mm -hmm. I could ask him, but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in that sense, it becomes quite literally performance, right? The entertainer, the singer, the actor can in fact act out literally uh, and has a, uh, is given a stage which is not given to most, most people and therefore can almost, um, there are theories about people being on the margin, uh, which would be true for entertainers, having a kind of freedom to act on the margins that they couldn't do if they were at the, the center. Um, and I think part of, we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about um, uh, uh, buyer at HBCUs, which presents its own stage um, and, and how that plays out, especially in terms of him being expelled from both, mm -hmm. right? Um, I pulled up this poem I always think of when I'm um, thinking about uh, this whole idea of, oops, let me go back, of, of uh, performance of masking and passing. It's a poem written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar in 1895 but it resonates so powerfully about all kinds of masking, right? Whether it's uh, race or 
oh yeah, or class, I'll go buy my fake Michael Kors and pretend I'm in a different class. Um, there are all kinds of ways, right? People are trying to move from the margin and re redefine themselves as the center and in doing so not be true to themselves. Um, let me read the poem for you. Uh, we, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. Um, Dunbar, of course, is writing during the, um, in part, the heyday right, of uh, minstrelsy and minstrel shows and blackface, right? Um, and uh, uh, it's talking about this trope of the happy servant, you know, the uh, um, happy slave who is um, joyful uh, in their oppression. Uh, but I think it applies across uh, various arenas of, of intersectionality, race, class, gender, and, and sexual orientation um, as well. Is your hand up, Jennifer? Oh, you're clapping. OK. <laughs> uh, I was going to say that that is a beautiful, I just made a screenshot of it. It's a beautiful poem. Thank you. Oh, it is very moving. And it's, it's, it's used over and over and over and over again in African American studies in so many ways to talk about the mask and the reality. Um, and how part of ma masking, though, is also part of survival. In other words, it's right, you kind of have to mask. Absolutely. Yeah. In some ways, there's an artistry to doing this really well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Your life could depend on it. it right? Absolutely, definitely your life can depend on it, for sure. One of the things, I'm sorry, I meant to say earlier, when we were talking about um, passing and, and acting out and uh, social and cultural cues about sexual orientation, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things I think we have to say, though, is that people continue to be killed, murdered. Yes, absolutely. For acting out and being identified. Absolutely. Uh, as queer. So when uh, I do my trainings, yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up, Lily. <laughs> yeah. really. When I do my trainings, um, I always ask the audience, do they know the average life expectancy of mm -hmm. trans people? Does anyone know? You can either type it in chat or you can say it. How long do you think trans people get to live in this country specifically? <laughs> I would say between 30, 35. Because right. Because so many prejudiced people that their lives are really in danger all the time. Absolutely. So if you are a white transgender person your life expectancy is probably about 70 to 80. But if you are a black transgender person, specifically a black transgender woman, your life expectancy is actually 30. Oh my God. Right? So when we're thinking about uh, passing, there's actually a term in the queer community called living stealth, meaning that you can go through society and no one be able to look at you and say, that's a person that's trans, mm. right? And there's actually safety in not being able to, in people not being able to tell mm. that you are a part of the trans community, mm. right? Think about like, uh, when we think about suicidal ideation for the trans community, 
about 40% of trans people over their lifetime have a suicidal ideation. And of the 40% that had the ideation, 90% of them had an attempt before the age of 25. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at people that, yeah. you know, they're not being supported by their community, by their family, mm -hmm. by society, mm -hmm. and they don't have you know, the resources oh, that they sure. need to be able to, you know, have good mental and physical health. So when it's, you think it, of like path it, passing, like that's still something people try and do today. They try to pass through the world without people knowing that they're a part of the LGBTQ community. And this can, this can go for different countries too, right? If, I, if my fiance and I wanna travel to certain countries, if we go, we have to act differently than we normally would. Yeah. Or even certain parts of the United States, right? Yeah. If, <laughs> let's, let's bring it home. <laughs> if yeah. we were to walk in certain states, I think we would definitely be more in danger because of who we are mm -hmm. than if we were to be in other parts of the United States. So there right. is definitely you know, safety and security and being able to pass and people not being able to tell who you are, which is why people hide who they are. Right. And it's not surprising. And it makes um, what we see with Bayard truly extraordinary. Uh, and so on one hand, we can look at his, um, uh, clearly look at his brilliance in activism and his bravery in activism. But I think we need to see his bravery in activism just in day-to-day -day life of of kind of being who he was at all times and suffering the consequences, but taking those consequences and not allowing that to shift who he was mm -hmm. into a performance and masking mode. Uh, he remained true to himself, which is, I would argue, a hard thing for any of us to do. Yes. When all of societal pressures say conform, right? Uh, conform and make the rest of us feel comfortable right. with, with, with who you are. Um, and so uh, we can, um, let me go back. So we know that uh, uh, human biological differences uh, and characteristics have nothing to do with what we have constructed to be race. The Human Genome Project helped to uh, do a deeper dive right into the scientific, uh, uh, the science of uh, human difference and that we're all one species. And if anything, there's more uh, diversity within groups than across groups, right? Um, and we know, as several of you have said, that the socially constructed characteristics are really translating into power and privilege uh, and put into law to uh, codify um, uh, arenas of power and privilege, but also in terms of day-to-day -day behavior, how you walk down the street, how you interact with people, how you negotiate life. Um, and then finally, similar to what we talked about with uh, gender uh, consciousness and identity and uh, identity around sexual orientation, we can take those same definitions and understand how individuals do have a sense of how they identify in a racially constructed society. Um, it's defined by, uh, in part, history, right? It's defined by culture and aesthetics as well, and we're going to look at some of those. We have not specifically talked about racism as a category. Uh, but as we begin to now talk about, next talk about Bayard and the, his life and historical context, um, we can construct racism in a variety of ways, both implicit and explicit. Does somebody mm -hmm. want to unpack what um, they think that that means or the differences between an implicit and an explicit bias? Or should I take that on? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can try. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, well, explicit, I think, is, is the obvious. If somebody uses a, a racial epithet or um, denies you a, a 
I don't know, doesn't let you into their country club or something of that sort, that would be quite explicit. I, and I think most of that is legally not allowed, I guess not in some private situations, but and certainly not socially sanctioned. It's the implicit that is um, more problematic. It's when um, you cross the street because you see somebody that you think is shady looking and that person is not of your racial construct or you lock your doors in your car, all these things that you say, oh, I'm just trying to be safe. Well, if it were a white girl walking down the street, you wouldn't feel that you weren't safe if it's a black boy wearing a hoodie. And so I think that's what the implicit bias is. And I guess that also relates, it's not on here, but to issues of microaggressions where you, I mean, that, that is sort of a microaggression as experienced by the kid. Right. Um, so that, that's how I would, um, I do have one request when you're, as you're talking about these things, or maybe for next, if I could make it as a question for next time. Yeah. Uh, if you guys could speak on, on the issue of, of gaze and, and specifically on white gaze and how that interacts with um, identity. Mm -hmm. And th anyhow, that's just a good question for, you know. I have I, a question. Um, are you saying white gaze like g-a-z-e exactly okay so how white, so for example in the play fairview where that topic came up i don't know if either of you saw that play but where it's very expressly mm -hmm. um you know and, and and i have uh, I, mean, I think i told you i'm the person whose kids are, are writing on um or my son mm -hmm. wrote on, on segregation my daughter's writing mm -hmm. on this issue and and i'm just curious to know what, what you both of you as scholars think about this because she's looking at, so I'm trying to also learn about so that I can keep up with my kids okay. who are far smarter. You know, her, her whole point is that not only is race a construct, but it's constructed by other people looking at you as opposed to how you look at yourself. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious how that connects. Actually, we have that today. <laughs> oh good oh wow okay uh, so, so so we will i will turn to you <laughs> so i'm gonna so meet myself <laughs> oh that was that was perfect this is yeah. like always the perfect class when <laughs> the students are just you know all aligned in the same direction so that's that's fabulous um um, we see with, with Bayard uh, in particular that he experiences both of these clearly. Uh, and um, uh, let's pause just a little bit and talk about his early experiences with the explicit bias. Can you, uh, any of you recall a specific incident and how he responded to that explicit bias? Well, he wasn't allowed to go into his friend's house, I ever call, right? I read that last week, but wasn't right. there an incident when he wasn't allowed to do that? That was right. the first time he had. I, I think he. I think had that a was, very good friend. Yeah, right. His right. best friend, a, right? Right, not a acquaintance. Right. And then there was also an issue with like the graduation speech or something. Yes. Yeah, I, I read it last week, so, but the, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the graduation speech in particular. Yeah, that one, that one as well, that he experienced as a, as a teenager. And we're going to uh, later on hear him speak about these, uh, the explicit bias and what he does with that, which becomes the, the lesson for us. Um, um, and just moving through the other, other three categories, and you realize we've just tried to collapse stuff into easy sound bites to, uh, uh, for our discussing, discussions. Um, racism can also be interpersonal as well as intrapersonal. Um, and we will also talk specifically about systemic and institutional racism. Uh, we want to see it as, uh, to some degree, when we talk about the interpersonal, intrapersonal, we're talking about individual behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, which are implicit or explicit. Well, we're talking about uh, systemic or institutional, which can also be implicit or explicit. Yep. Um, right? Um, we are talking about not just individuals, but systems. Systems. Uh, which dictate mm -hmm. everybody's behavior. Yes. 
I have right. a really good example of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really good example of that. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. So my high school, I went to high school in 2006, 2010. I know I'm super young. Uh, <laughs> but when I was there all four years, we had a white and a black cafeteria. So this white and black cafeteria was put in place when segregation was a thing. And even though legally there was no one telling you you had to go to the white or the black cafeteria, students, teachers, the principal, every security, everyone called it the white and black cafeteria and people self-segregated themselves into the appropriate cafeteria. It was something that was spoken about by everyone, right? We all knew like, oh, I'm going to the white cafeteria. I'm going to the black cafeteria, right? And people would actually segregate themselves into the appropriate cafeteria. And then on the white cafeteria side, they had different food than the black cafeteria. The white cafeteria, you have soups, salads, sandwiches, healthy stuff, water. And then on the black side, you had chicken, pizza, sandwiches, uh, different things like that. I went to Union High School. Union High School is where I went to high school. And not only that, but they even, the two sides had different uh, surroundings too. So on the white, the white cafeteria side, they would leave the doors open so that you can go outside in and out. And then on the black cafeteria side, there was a chain on the door. Right, so like you think about the history of it and all four years when I was there, nobody changed anything. It was until my younger sister came in three years behind me that they decided to make it the upper and underclassmen cafeteria. Right, but this was something that was, we actively all played a part in it. So the black cafeteria had POC, so people that were Asian, uh, people that were Hispanic, people that are black, people that were from different countries, literally all on one side. And then you had the white cafeteria that had uh, people that were Spanish, people that were Portuguese, people that were Italian, and they would literally be on the other side. We could cross the different sides if we wanted to, but this was just something that the high school allowed up until my sister came in behind me three years afterwards. Uh, mm -hmm. How was that allowed? It was allowed by the people that worked there right? The principal, the teacher, the security guards, they're all old enough to remember that there was segregation and they allowed mm -hmm. for that culture to continue in the school without addressing it, without making drastic changes. That's how it was allowed. It was systemic, right? As right. an institution, you literally had laws that were in place that separated people of color from white people. And even though the law was taken down, it's the culture was still there. Oh, it's in New Jersey. Kate, uh, this is in Union, New Jersey. Oh, Union yeah. High School, New Jersey is where I went to school. Um, and they don't have that cafeteria. The, the cafeterias are there upper and underclassmen. But when I was there, yeah, that was a thing. And, you know, looking back on it <laughs> after I went to college and, you know, started thinking about it critically, I'm like, you know, that was institutionalized racism. Oh yeah, both implicit and explicit, and I don't think I realized it at the time because my my mind didn't really work that way. But maybe I will write about it, Kate. <laughs> oh, I was thinking, I was thinking the same thing. The the chain on one door and the yeah. door open. I mean, the the systemic meaning of one being open and one being closed, closed so that so that you know the whole idea of control and dangerous black kids and mm -hmm. um and then the food being different this is just yeah. so yeah deep. you need to write this right now <laughs> it should be written up yeah here's here's the thing i was thinking that was more segregated than my white high school columbus high school in columbus georgia in 1970. Ooh, wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, I could tell you some other stories, but in terms of cafeteria <laughs> stories, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yours is. But on the other hand, I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah. it doesn't, 
you know, I don't, yeah, I don't think, I can't believe that. I said, yeah, that, that sounds. I have to look into when they actually, because I'm looking at the comments, the chat here. Sundra, I don't know when you went to Union High School, but I have to look at when, when that was actually put in place, because obviously it was before me, but, you know, it was after, I want to say 20, when did she go, when did my sister go to high school? She was three years after me, so like 20, 20, 13 is when they took it down like officially changed it to upper and underclassmen cafeteria but it, it I, I don't and I don't even know the reason why they did that I don't know if there was someone that called them out for it or if the school felt that it was time to change like I, I don't know what made them change it but thankfully they did <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but we also know those kind of changes don't occur Unless yeah. there is an inst, usually unless there's a push. I mean that somebody really does have to become the activist and the troublemaker, yeah. uh, and uh, um, and that institutions don't voluntarily do that. It I'm gonna to try and like uh, maybe interview some people in my town and see yeah. like what created that change. Like I said, it was that after I had already graduated, so I don't know what sparked you know, what ignited the change, but I would love to find out what happened. <laughs> no, it would, be, would be interesting. And that Bianca, interesting. I, should, I will remind me to share with you, there was a, a film done on the um, magnet, the development of the magnet system in Montclair. And mm. although very often Montclair and Montclairians, even new people like me who've only been there 28 years, uh, think of Montclair as this progressive liberal place, and it was always that way. Uh, the history of segregation and mm -hmm. redlining and, yeah. uh, and Montclair is palpable, and, and who the people were, it was very grassroots, yeah. who actually got integration in Montclair and came up with the idea of the magnet system. It was completely grassroots. It wasn't the school system. It wasn't the institutions. It was mm -hmm. you know, like the people. Uh, who got that work done. We want to move now to looking specifically using all, all of these um, uh, larger theories we've talked about uh, as our kind of foundation. We want to look at uh, uh, Rustin's identities and values and activism. We've talked about them some as exemplary of some of the theory we've talked about, but we want to hear some of his own words, talk about his family, talk about his uh, beliefs uh, formed through the church um, and HBCUs. Um, just to see if we can get this clip to work today. Um, we're gonna play about seven minutes of this if, um, get it. I'm probably not queuing it exactly where I need it, but it's close. Can you make it louder? Louder.
Hey, Lily. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not hearing anything. And the only sound that was coming through was coming through a student's screen. Um, can you close that sharing and try to hit share screen again? And then there are two buttons on the bottom that say share computer audio. There are two um, radio buttons or check boxes in the bottom. Can you try that? You're muted. So stop share. Yeah, stop share. And then do the new share again. And then before you click your, your window that you're going to share, uh, check the two boxes at the bottom of that box, the share computer sound and optimize screen sharing. You see it? Yep. Sorry. No worries. Got it. I'm learning. Okay, let me. Okay. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't work, we'll just continue. I'm Eric Marcus and I've spent a great deal of my life defending all of those groups there would have been less of a, a determined effort to defend me. This is from the New York Times of August 16, 1963, written by one of the best writers of the Times, which says, Negro rally aid rebut senator. Mm -hmm. So I did you have to read that now, but I thought you might find something Thanks. in that of interest. Oh, that's great. Thank you. In other words, so Negro uh, strikes me so much as the New York Times homosexual. Well, in those, days, in those days, that was the accepted yeah. Yeah, parlance, yeah. I know. Yeah. But with all the work you were doing mm -hmm. um, in uh, human rights at the time, um, you must have been feeling some sense like you had this coming. I mean, you had a right to, um, you know, have your um, gayness as well as your blackness. Well, um, one of the reasons and, you know, that I decided, Quaker beliefs one defended. One of the reasons I decided that I should no longer remain in the closet mm -hmm. came from an experience I had as a black. One day in 19, way back as far as 1947, I walked into a bus in the South, all prepared to do what I had always done in the South, take a seat in the rear. As I was going by, the second seat to go to the rear, a white child reached out for the red necktie I was wearing and pulled it, whereupon its mother said, don't touch a nigger. Something happened and I said to myself, if I go and sit quietly in the back of that bus now, that child who was so innocent of race relations that it was going to play with me mm -hmm. will have seen so many blacks go in the back and sit down quietly that it's going to end up saying they like it back there. I've never seen anybody protest against it. That's what people in the South were saying. So I said, I owe it to that child not only to my own dignity, but I owe it to that child that it should be educated to know that blacks do not want to sit in the back, and therefore I should get arrested, letting all these white people in the bus know that I do not accept that. Now, 
it occurred to me shortly after that that it was an absolute necessity for me to declare homosexuality because if I didn't I was a part of the prejudice I was aiding and abetting the prejudice that was a part of the effort to destroy me and that in the long run the only way I could be a free whole person was to face the shit but from my own experience I know how long it can take to free yourself 34 years is a long time to free yourself mm. So when did you first come out as gay to yourself? I recognized that I was gay when I was in high school. Where was that? That was in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Westchester High? Yeah. (laughs) But I was fortunate and uh, was very successful at hiding it. Mm-hmm. because I was on the championship uh, football team. <laughs> I was on the championship track team. I won the all-state uh, uh, high school championship for tennis. Uh, I was so popular and the uh, boys in the school liked me so that they automatically made me the manager of the basketball team, I couldn't play basketball at all, <laughs> in order that I would get four letters, because the manager got four letters. Okay. So, in, in uh, Bayert's own words, how do we, how does he help us define intersectionality? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I mean, this is a fascinating, I mean, it's, it's, it uh, complements what we've read in Troublemaker really well, but it's a deeper dive into the question was um, that the journalist asked him is, when did you come out to yourself? What do you, what do all of you make of the, the response he gives? For some reason at my screen isn't on, so I can't see you. Uh oh, um, hmm. maybe stop sharing your screen. Okay. Here we go. And then maybe share it back. And then go back. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes if they open and close it again. Yeah. What's fascinating to me about this particular clip, and it's one of the reasons we tried to do it last week, and it didn't work at all, uh, is he actually connects this incident on the bus with a white child reaching out for his red tie to coming out to himself. Uh, and the, the uh, intersectionality of understanding, I think the words he use, uses is, if he didn't address this, he was aiding and abetting his own oppression. I thought, wow, that's... <laughs> um, it's deep. It's, it is so deep. <laughs> and here's part of the problem is so deep, is that many people, if not most people, do aid and abet their own oppression because it's so hard to go up against um, bias that is so endemic that it's implicit and explicit. It's institutional. It's also personal. Um, uh, It is um, and can be even dangerous, right? He says he has to put his physical self 
in the midst of this um, construction of who he is, both in terms of race and sexual orientation. Bianca, did you want to add something to uh, yeah, that uh, particular piece? Actually, I wanted to add something. That, yes, thank uh, you. In order to say something, if one can find the courage to speak up immediately, it's, it's very helpful in that way that not being afraid to speak up and, you know, clear the air as, as you think, you know, mm -hmm. to speak up and say something when something like that happened in the bus. Right. The thing I, I also think about is uh, people who are silent when they hear the racist joke, right, or hear the sexist joke, or hear the gay joke, and they laugh and inside themselves, they're going, oh, that's, you know, that's really awful and say absolutely nothing and may even chuckle a little. Um, and the pain that must, you know, the kind of internal struggle that causes of not even being true to themselves in recognizing that kind of bias. And that happens as we know all the time. It's actually very common. Any other comments? We're going to move now to, unless you have a question, I am going to pull up um, the screen this time to, um, let's talk about his family, Julia and Jennifer being raised by his grandparents who he initially thought were his parents. How do you, how do you understand this upbringing of his and the influence of the Rustin household. And in some ways we can also obviously attach that also to um, the, uh, how he takes that upbringing into the rest of his life. What's the, what are the connections for him? Hi, it's Sandra. I, I'm, I'm struck, I'm just absolutely struck. I read the part about the tie on the bus mm -hmm. and uh, response, and I thought only of it at that moment, you know, you know, the crying out of wanting racial uh, dignity and so forth. But as I'm listening to the discussion and how you put it in uh, concept, I could see that moment where his whole life is saying, I have to be who I am. You know, I'm not just black, I'm, I'm, I'm not just gay, I am a whole person. And maybe that's what really struck him on that bus, you know, to uh, have to stand and then for his wholeness. And then as you go back to um, his, his upbringing by his grandmother, <laughs> who encouraged him to be who he was, um, I think he always had permission to be authentic mm -hmm. and he just didn't know it until these incidences started to happen and then he found this collision of um, psyche and, and spirit demanding that he be who, whole, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, just struck me as you talked about it. Right. I mean, it tells us something very, very, a uh, kind of uh, um, the enormous potential power of what the messaging is to children as they grow up. Um, and the kind of, uh, not just resilience, but I, I like the way you put it, Sandra, it's a kind of reserve that you can kind of pull out as a kind of weapon uh, as you negotiate uh, life, and especially for um, for buy it. Uh, what exactly did he say to uh, the kid on the bus? I'm sorry. I was just wondering what exactly did he say to the kid on the bus? I he don't remember respond. reading what he responded. He didn't respond to the child. It's just the idea. It's what the parent told the child. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's how he, he, it resonated with him and made okay. him realize the importance of his response. 
Um, but then what was his response? Because he said, if I don't do anything, then I'll be participating in this whole issue. Did how he, one, how did he react? Did he go and sit in the back or did he sit in the front? He sat in the front. And so it's the, okay. so yeah, so part of, part of what he, he is seeing, uh, as we all know, is that the social constructions of race and other categories have to be taught, that people aren't born with them. And he sees in this child, a child who sees a red tie <laughs> uh, and is drawn to it. And there is no uh, interpretation of the black man wearing the tie and his blackness. Uh, has no meaning to this child. And he realizes he will be teaching the child, given the mother's reaction, he will be teaching the child that the mother is correct if he then goes and sits in the, in the colored section of the, of the bus. And that becomes the kind of revelation about will I uh, uh, be um, complicit Right. It's on page 43 in our, in our in the book. book. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I wanted to jump in here, if I might. Um, for some reason, this discussion of the child and on the bus brought to mind, um, it was a TV ad or something decades ago that went something like this. You have to be taught to hate and fear you have to be taught from year to year. It has to be drummed in your dear little ears. You have to be carefully taught. Hmm. You have to be taught from year to year. I, do, I couldn't tell you what the ad was for, but hmm. um, we all are brought up in a way and we're taught and it goes back generations and it expresses itself. Um, as we grow up in some cases, sadly. Um, and then to your original question, Lily, mm -hmm. about the influences in Riot's um, early life, I think the Quaker influence was tremendous. Um, Could you say some more about that, of, of how, how that translated into his life? Well, that what everyone has a light within life. them, everyone is worthy. Um, you know, they're basically colorblind. You know, he initially um, went to a Quaker church where blacks and whites congregated. You know, he later, you know, went to the Methodist church, I believe, where that was segregated. But um, they love all. It's all about love. Everyone is on the even playing field. And I think right. that, that was a huge influence in his life. Right. Well, the black church isn't, in some ways, it's not the black church that's segregated, it's white churches that are segregated. Right, sorry, I didn't, right. I didn't state right. that properly, right. Right. exactly. With the, yeah, with the exception of, at this point, at least in Westchester, uh, this mm -hmm. particular uh, um, uh, friends uh, meeting. It's interesting, uh, when I started to think deeply about uh, what you just talked about, Diana, in terms of this, these uh, very, very important Quaker, uh, values and beliefs, and how and how how is it intersecting with what must have been a black church experience, right? Mm -hmm. At this AME church, because they actually are going to both. He is going to both. Um, his grandmother's at the friend's meeting house, and then also going to her husband's church, which is mm -hmm. the the AME church. Bill, did you want to chime in? I, I know you, you unmuted. I didn't know if you wanted to add something, Bill. You, you unmuted, so I, di I didn't want to uh, leave you out of the conversation. I don't think I am muted. Let's see. No, I don't seem to be muted. No, I'm just listening to you all. Okay. I, I was just welcome, <laughs> welcoming you in just in case. Um, again, since I'm so new to this technology, I could easily make some, some mistakes. Um, let's pull in, what I want us to do now is kind of pull in looking at both um, 
the the AME Church and the Society of Friends values, which I think are very very well uh, uh, described in the the book. But it occurred to me doing a little bit more research, I realized, for example, Julia was a not just a member of the NAACP, she was a one of the founding members. So one of the charter members, I believe in 1916 um, or so, and the NAACP itself was only like seven years old at the time. The pastor of Bethel AME was the president, first president of the NAACP. And it's not unusual for the NAA local NAACPs to be founded in black churches. Uh, it's true in Montclair's NAACP was founded at St. Mark's. In Morristown, the, the um, NAACP was founded at Bethel AME in Morristown. This is very common. Um, and so one of the things we should see is not so much here, the, here's the Society of Friends over here, and here's Bethel AME over here, but rather we should see that there's a Black community that is um, very connected in part through the church. Whether Julia is uh, uh, going to the uh, uh, friend's meeting house or not. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I see in Bayard is not only these strong Quaker values, but also understanding the centrality of the Black church to the Black community as a place to assemble, um, a place to assemble with autonomy, with, without the white gaze that we um, was mentioned briefly uh, earlier. Uh, it's a place where a liberation theology evolves all the, uh, from the period of enslavement on into the 20th century, that this is a place where black freedom is declared as a God-given right. Uh, it's a place where black leadership, if we think about what uh, Bayard experiences in terms of the tenacity and power of his uh, grandparents, he sees Black leadership all the time within the AME church and the, and the power of that community. Um, and then, of course, property ownership, education, uh, the evolution of Black culture. We know that music becomes very important to him. Uh, uh, it's a part of his life, part of his talent also. And we also see, uh, and I think it's important here, we also see the Black church playing a role in what I mentioned last week about the politics of respectability. I didn't know if we were especially clear on what that is, but it's in some ways it's related to masking and passing. And it is uh, the importance for uh, Black people to uh, show themselves to be deserving, right? Of, uh, of citizenship, of respect, of uh, being treated as human beings by how they appear, how they speak, how they dress, <laughs> uh, uh, decorum, intellect, culture, all of that should be excellent. My best example is always the women uh, walking to work in the Montgomery bus boycott had on their hats, they had on their white gloves. Uh, they were the image of these uh, domestic workers were the image of Black women's respectability within their activism. Uh, and that kind of, you know, when we look at the um, expectations even of Black students at HBCUs, we can see that that politics of respectability really playing out because this is supposed to be the Black middle and professional class, the exemplars, right, of uh, the best achievement that Black people can have. And so in some ways, it's not surprising that the rules are really rigid about behavior, decorum, because you represent the race, not just the race, you represent the race's potential uh, to ever achieve anything. And the, the weight of the race is on their shoulders. Uh, so on one hand, we can have a critique of, in part, this is 
uh, playing into a notion of black inferiority and black people needing to prove themselves. On the other hand, it's playing into a political and social reality of how race is constructed of black people being inferior. Uh, and, and how do you correct that uh, view of society, right? Uh, any questions about, about the, the role of the black church? I know I've run through it pretty quickly for you. <laughs> I just wanted to comment, you, you struck a chord with me when you began to talk about it, because Bayard in one part of the book talks about <clears throat> when the uh, police were coming to get the protesters, um, it was his suggestion who had marched, I, I forget exactly what the incident was, but um, they, they had marched and so I guess the warrants were out for them to be arrested, but Bayer told them not to hide, not to run, but to put on your best clothes and march up to the courthouse and give, turn yourselves in with dignity and respect and the people were clapping. And so as you talk about how Blacks presented themselves in such a way during these protests and marches, and you can see it in their visual, um, look, there was a call for dignity in what they were doing, and this respectability was was in many ways like the message about how they were going to present themselves. So I just found it very um, in, in, in inspiring to know that he was also part of that movement of respectability. Don't be um, less than who you are show them you're a man, show them you're a woman by how you present yourself. And injustice has to be st stood up against with dignity is what I think his message was. Right, right, exactly. Um, and, and that there's no contradiction necessarily between these, the politics of respectability, which we can see as a form of activism, right? I mean, it has as its goal uh, an attempt to um, affirm and claim Black humanity and uh, citizenship in particular. So thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier that HBCUs in particular become kind of the, um, in some ways we can say they become the incubator, right, for Black respectability. Um, uh, part of a, a, a combined with the Black church, these are the institutions where Black respectability is supposed to be born and kind of shown off and go out into the world. And it's not just about middle class status, it really is supposed to be to serve the race, right? Um, anyone uh, would love to hear your reactions about him being um, expelled from uh, Cheney, which began as the Institute for Colored Youth. It was the very first college founded for African Americans in the United States. Um, Wilberforce University in Ohio, um, an AME founded uh, university, uh, expelled from, from both. Your response to when you read the, those parts of the book. Well, there's one incident where I'm, I'm looking for it now where they don't say why he was expelled. And that made me more curious as to what happened. Um, and supposedly he says that he, he never spoke of it and the president of the college never spoke of it. So is, was there something that was ever revealed? Right, well, even in that in the book, to literally be put out of school, um, and I believe that was his senior year. This is just before he was to, to graduate. Would mean it was something that was so um, irredeemable, right? Um, and uh, we can't say explicitly what it may have been because the book doesn't tell us. Um, 
but we know that for somebody who was one of the highest performing students in every way, um, that it would have been something very powerful to have put him out of school. Um, and when I read it, my, my visceral reaction was, what a tragedy mm. this is, that he is, that he is being put out, of, put out of school. Um, what I would like us to do now, instead of continuing um, uh, with more detail I was going to do on black colleges, we're about to end, so I wanted to uh, end here and have a skip. We'll come back to uh, the societal and con uh, constructions and broader context on May 4th, where we talk about Jim Crow. We'll talk about the white gaze and black caricatures and how black people are presented in the public arena. Um, and then we'll move on from there talking about civil rights organizations uh, and how they evolved and Bayard's participation in so many different civil rights organizations, uh, the leadership role he played. But I, here I want us to take a few minutes uh, as we end uh, for you to throw out any other topics that you would like to include on the 14th. I've already written down uh, the white gaze and, uh, um, and black identity. <clears throat> Are there uh, any others? If you don't think of them now, it doesn't mean you can't bring them to us on uh, uh, the 14th. On the 14th, right. Mm -hmm. But are there any others that we might be uh, prepared to pull into next week's discussion? Or parts of the book you would like us to take a deeper dive on? That would mm -hmm. be the other thing we could do. Okay, well, give it some thought and uh, just jot down um, either themes, questions, topics you'd like for us to talk about next week and you can just bring them to us at the very beginning of class and we'll try to in this very last section and then moving to our power and privilege exercise to include those topics. Yes. Any Thank questions? You. Yes. Thank you, Lily. Uh, I didn't finish the book, but by next week, I'm sure I'll have finished the book. So I will jot down whatever I feel we need to talk about. That's fine. Actually, I meant to start off by saying to everybody now get the book, <laughs> because I know there was some delay. Um, it, does anyone still need the book? Everyone has it. Okay. Great. Uh, it's also one of the reasons we knew there was a delay in, in getting the book. And so we, as you can see, we've kind of constructed this around moving through the early part of his life to actually give you time to uh, finish the book by, by uh, next Thursday. So Jennifer, you're right on time. Not Thank a problem. You. Thank <laughs> you're you. welcome. Probably you are doing a great job with the Zoom business. Uh, <laughs> well. I am so glad I'm not having to teach online. This is, you all are my, <laughs> you all are my guinea pigs. And so I think I have a forgiving cohort here of my peers who, <laughs> who can understand. Uh, but but I, I, I told Bianca I would try to uh, move beyond my kindergarten technology skills and, and not rely on her completely, just a little. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a learning experience for all of us. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so very much. I hope this has been a uh, useful section as we began to look at uh, some of the details of Bayard's life, hear his own voice, uh, the ways in which we can bring the theory of all of these um, human con social constructions into human life is lived. Uh, and see the power of the way that uh, Bayard was able to continually claim and proclaim himself uh, in ways that I know we find, uh, I personally find very compelling in my own life and even reflecting on myself yeah. uh, and the degrees to which I may proclaim or mask. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great class. Have a wonderful week. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye.